All right, let's take our Bibles this morning and go to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, I'll be honest with you, it's going to be a while before I get there. All right, just warning you, okay? Romans chapter 11. I, I've mentioned before that I like superhero movies, like the Marvel movies. Um, they're, they're fun. They're, they're action-packed. I like that. Holds my attention. It's fun to check out a reality sometimes for a couple hours. Sometimes we kind of need that maybe, I guess. But I like to follow a storyline. I've always liked fiction. It's completely fictional and, uh, and could never really happen. <laughs> you know, Because you watch some of those movies like, wow, if that ever really happened, that would be awful. <laughs> you know? but, uh, but those are comic and movie characters who act heroically in a movie because it's written by a writer for them to do so. They are not real, and they are not real heroes. This week we celebrate the 4th of July and the birth of our nation, a nation founded upon the belief in God and the principles of his word, though that's not always being taught anymore. But there is no doubt that most of our founding fathers had the belief that government was ordained by God and should be submissive to God. We have wandered from those values, haven't we? And listen, they weren't perfect. And the beginning of our nation was not perfect. We had some very ugly things. But we're still built upon that foundation. The sad part is that many men and women have heroically given their lives to preserve those values. For our founding fathers and those heroes, this week we celebrate, we are thankful they are real-life heroes who sacrifice many times everything for us, and we should give praise for, to God. But there's one who is our true hero, and he is the one that we should talk about. He is the one that we should celebrate. He is the one who led his faithful followers to form a nation of freedom. He is the one who has used this nation as a beacon of freedom and sent out our soldiers to fight for the freedom of others who are oppressed because he cares for those who are oppressed. So today, instead of focusing on our country and waving the flag as a patriot, even though I'm wearing my red, white, blue today, I want to talk about how marvelous our God is. Because if we don't get back to Him, we will fall, and the efforts of our heroes will no longer matter. I told you to go to Romans. We're going to be all over the place in Scripture, so most of them are going to be on the screen today, but eventually I'm going to get to Romans chapter 11, so I wanted to read that out of the Bible. But we're going to look at characteristics of God. Now, I'm not talking about love, mercy, and grace, because those things are things we already know are a benefit to us. I want to talk today about characteristics of God that set him apart from us, the things that make him holy and sacred and reveal our need for his love, mercy, and grace, things that might not seem to directly benefit us, but are only true of him and do benefit us greatly. What makes him so good? What makes him so awesome? What makes him marvelous? <laughs> what makes him the perfect hero? Number one, he is sovereign. He is sovereign. That means he is the supreme power or authority. He is over all our elected officials. No matter what decisions they make, he's still over top of them. No matter what direction they may want to go in, he is still over them all the time. He's over all his children. He is ruler. He is king of his kingdom and of all things. King David wrote in Psalm 103, 19, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. Now, now King David, we've been studying Psalms for a long time now, when he's like several years, because I'm slow, right? No, nah, it just takes a long time. But he's a great, he was a great and mighty king who understood, though, himself that he was not God. He was a king, but God was his king. That's how we come to call God king of kings. He is sovereign over all those who even lead nations in the world. Now, what does all this mean? Well, his sovereignty means he can do what he wants to do, and no one can stop him. Isaiah 14, 27 says, For the Lord of hosts has planned, and who can frustrate it? And as far as stretched out hand, who can turn it back? 
Psalm 115, 3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. <laughs> see, here's the difference between God and man. You see, whenever I try to do what I please, it doesn't usually work out too well. When we try to do what we please, it can lead to destruction, it can lead to turmoil and all kinds of problems when we do whatever we please. Only God can do whatever He pleases and it always works out for what is best. Because he's sovereign over all things. What pleases him is always what is best. What he does always accomplishes his glory, which is his goal. So if God is sovereign and can do what he wants to do, and he wants to do what, he brings, what brings glory to himself, then as his children... We should let him do what he wants to do in us so that we bring him glory. As sovereign, he also rules over all of creation. Colossians 1 affirms he created, holds everything together by his power. When you're out there looking up in the skies this week to look at fireworks and you're seeing the stars up there, remember, that's his. He hung that there, and they stay there because of his power. I mean, have you ever stopped to really contemplate an eclipse that we had like we had this year I mean how the moon is always in the same place and the sun is always in the same place and they, they, they do the same thing but yet they're always inching in a certain direction at all times and eventually we have an eclipse and then it's many many years before we have another one and, and, and things like that that's because everything stays right where God put it because he is sovereign as sovereign he is unquestionable in his authority even Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar let me give a reference on that. Was brought to his knees by God, and in Daniel 4.35 declared, He does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, What have you done? That's King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, a pagan king. How much more should we as his people have that viewpoint of God? Sovereignty means there's nothing he does not own, rule over, or have the ability to control. Even our free will has been given to us by the sovereign will of God. Our call is to use our free will to surrender ourselves willingly to his authority and say, I don't need my free will anymore. I just need your will. That's all I want. That gives him glory. That recognizes his sovereignty when we allow him to run our lives instead of running our own lives. As sovereign, he is El Elyon, the Lord Most High. His sovereignty makes him leadership for the wanderer. If you're wandering today, struggling in life, trying to figure out what direction you should go in, surrender yourself to the sovereign Lord and he will give you direction. He will give you guidance. He will lead you on the path that he has for you and desires you to be on. He cannot be defeated and he is the hero that lifts us out of the pit, sets our feet on the rock because he can. He's a marvelous God, amen? Now, his sovereignty is the overarching characteristic that makes him God. There, there are other words used to, to break down these characteristics in more precise terms, things that are only true of him and should bring us to willing submission before him. Things like he is omnipotent. He is omnipotent. That means he's all-powerful. Uh, the Bible says he's El Shaddai, God Almighty, amen? Hey. No one more powerful. As I said in my first point, that means he does what he wants, but it also means he has no inabilities. You ever thought about God that way? We, we know the scriptures with God, all things are possible, but have you ever thought about, flip that around in your mind, saying that means there's nothing he can't do if he so wills it. Growing up it is a dream of many little boys uh, to one day be able to dunk a basketball. I know it was my goal, it was Josh's goal, it was Alex's goal, I'm, you know. And um, I finally did it one day as an adult when we lowered the goal to eight feet. <laughs> I never grew big enough to dunk on a 10-foot goal. I have a five-foot, four-inch, four-and-a-half-inch, that's what a short guy always does, he adds that half-inch always, limitation. That's my limitation. I do not have the strength and power to overcome that limitation and do what I want. Bonnie tried that this week. And you see the results. 
had to go there. It was too easy. We all have inabilities. Accept that. Amen? Can we say amen to that? Okay. Not one person can do anything and everything they want to do. God alone has the power to do anything and everything he wants because he's omnipotent. Nothing is too difficult for him, and no one is powerful enough to stop him. The New Testament tells us repeatedly there's nothing impossible with God. So what does that mean for us? It means strength for the weak. If you're struggling today, feeling weak for what you're going through, maybe it's some illness, maybe it's some family issue, whatever it might be, and you're crying out to God for strength, you're going to the right place. Because in your weakness, you will find him to be strong. Because that's who he is. He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. And he's the only source that we can go to. We can try going to our spouses. We can try going to our parents. We can try going to our kids, to our best friend or whatever. But they can only offer us but so much strength to help us through. And if you're a believer here today and you've got people coming to you, let me tell you something. You're going to run out of gas sooner or later yourself trying to help someone. Direct them to God. Go to God with them. You get down on your knees together and you say, Oh, omnipotent God, we need your strength together to get through this. And he will do it. And he will be there for you. When we are unable to cope or overcome, he is. When we're about to be defeated in life, he has the power to give us victory. Always. He is marvelous in strength, and his strength is always available to his children because he is a marvelous God. Amen. Mm. Then, the next thing is, he is omniscient. Omniscient, he's all-knowing. You know, each day we meet people of varying levels of knowledge. In my full-time job, I might meet a plumber. Pretty common. I'm in irrigation sales. i got PVC pipe fittings there. So a plumber comes in every once in a while. He's looking for something he couldn't find at his normal supply house. And he says, well, let me try the irrigation place, see if I can find it there. Usually he has knowledge about certain things that I do not have much knowledge on because he's in plumbing. But at the same time, I probably have some knowledge about irrigation that he may not have. People can act like know-it-alls. You know somebody like that? <laughs> but nobody knows everything. God is holy and set apart from his creation. He's the only one who knows everything everything. Isaiah 55 on the screen says, very, we're very familiar with this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord, for as, high, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And I want you to understand, that gap, that gap between his thoughts and our thoughts isn't like this. My arms aren't wide enough. It, it's bigger than the furthest star. That gap is bigger than the furthest star we could see, even with the Hubble telescope, further than that. It is that big of a gap. 1 John 3.20 says, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. How would you feel if you met somebody who could read your mind, knew everything that you were thinking? I, I came up with three words as I was thinking about that. Frightened. Y'all may think you know what I'm thinking all the time, but you don't. Like, I don't know what you're thinking all the time, and you're thankful for that, aren't you? Yeah. I might feel intimidated, but the third word is the one we're all probably going to feel the most, vulnerable. We would feel vulnerable. But you know what? That's the kind of relationship God calls us into with him to recognize that he sees and knows everything in our heart, every thought we have, every action that goes on in our lives. He knows it all. We are totally laid bare before him. We are vulnerable before him, and that's okay. Why? Because he loves us. He is not going to violate that. He even knows the mess we're in. And he knows the messes we have yet to make and still remains faithful to us because he loves us and wants to forgive us and wants to make us more like himself. What does his omniscient mean, omniscience mean for us? It's confidence for the confused. When we don't know what to do, when we don't know how to handle it, we know with certainty we have a God who does. Amen. 
You may not understand what you're going through or have a plan for dealing with it, but he does, and you can trust him. Romans 11, I finally got there. Verse 33, slide down to that. I'm just going to read it. I'm not even going to break it down. Just soak in these words. Verse 33 of Romans 11. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became his counselor, or who is first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. What awesome words from the Apostle Paul. Our God is a marvelous God. Well, the fourth one, some of you already know what it is. He's omnipresent. That means there's no place that he is not. You didn't come here to meet with God here today like God wasn't with you already before you got here. You realize that, right? And those that are out of town today that aren't with us today, God's with them right where they are. Those that are going to be traveling that we prayed about, God's going to be right with them as they travel. Just as much as he's going to be right with you in your home after they've left at the same time. Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. That's intimidating too, isn't it? <laughs> God sees it all. He's aware of everything. Jeremiah 23, 24 says, Can a man hide himself in hiding places so I do not see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord? We can't hide from God. Don't try. Don't even want to. Let yourself be vulnerable to the God who's always with you. He is Jehovah Shema, the Lord who is presence. And that means for us that he is companionship for the lonely. If you're here today, you feel all alone. You feel like you're separated from everybody or everybody's abandoning you. That's just not true. The only one that really matters is always with you. He's always there, walking with you, no matter what. Have confidence in his presence. Have a certainty that no matter what, you are not alone. If all the relationships of this world were taken from us, we still have the one we were made to have a relationship with. I hear people say this all the time, and, and I'll use Natalie and I. I wasn't made for Natalie, and Natalie wasn't made for me. We were made for God. God just brought us together and realized that he could do more with us together than with us separately. We're all made for him, for his glory, for his praise, and for what he desires to do. He is omnipresent, and as such, he is a marvelous God. Finally, my last point today, and this is one you're going to go, duh, is he is eternal. <laughs> he is eternal. His name is El Olam. That's, I'm giving you various names of God today. I hope you've picked up on that. El Olam means the everlasting God with no beginning and no end. He gave us life when he created us and through Christ breathes his eternal life into us. 1 John 5, 11 said God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. The only way he can give us eternal life is because he is the marvelous eternal God. What does this mean for us? It's hope for the hopeless. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you never have to feel hopeless again. You might feel it in your present reality, but when you take that present reality to the Lord in prayer and lay that out before Him and cast all your cares on Him because He cares for you, you can walk away with hope because you have gone to the one who is our hope because He is our eternal hope. A believer feeling hopeless one day can know they have tomorrow because they've been gifted with eternal life by the eternal God. Because he has no end, we who are in Christ have no end. He is our eternal, marvelous God. We here at Bolivia Baptist often talk about the fact that we as a nation have forgotten God. I've kind of referenced it a little bit this morning. 
I believe that God has led me to preach this message on this day because he is no longer marvelous to us. And that mentality has permeated the church. God is an add-on in too many lives today, not the central heart of our life. We, we, we give glory to so many other things. Please don't talk about Mother Nature in front of me. Don't ever do that. You will offend me greatly. I, I don't tell you things that will offend me very well. That will offend me. God is the creator of this world. Yahweh, Jehovah, God. Because he is marvelous, and no one and nothing should ever take his place. It is not our country, though, that needs to remember God. Many, as we are beginning to see in our country, are lost, blind, and in total rebellion against God. No, it's his own people, the church. We need to lift up our eyes, look to him, remember that he is marvelous. We need to be restored to an awe of our God. He is God. Big G. Bigger than you. Right. God. We go around just kind of sometimes barely giving him a thought. We need to live our lives like he is marvelous. We Listen, we are the eternal children of the sovereign God who cannot be defeated, knows everything, and is all around us. We are not helpless and alone. The one true marvelous God is our God. We are his children, and we are called and chosen to live a life that lifts up our Father as the marvelous God he is. And if we're not doing that, that's the evidence that he is no longer marvelous to us. Because if he was marvelous to us, we wouldn't be able to help ourselves. We'd talk about him all the time. We'd have a song come out of our mouth all the time. Our goals would be his goals. Our will would be submitted to his will. If he was marvelous to us, it's time, church, to stop playing at it and start really living like he is our marvelous, awesome God. Isaiah 46, 9 says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. So exercise the blessing of your free will and submit to him. Let him be your one and only hero. Let him be your marvelous God. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you and we praise you. You are marvelous and you are wonderful and you are awesome. God, forgive me for the times that I float through the day and act like you're barely there when you're there at all times. God, forgive me for the times when I whine in my weakness of my flesh and cry about the struggles in life when you are my omnipotent God and you are right there ready to help. God, forgive me when I act so confused what do I do, God, what do I do when you are my omniscient, all-knowing God? God, forgive us for forgetting that you are sovereign and you are marvelous. Remind us, restore us, renew us, revive us today, God, we pray. That you would be marvelous, you would be our awesome God, and that everybody around us would see it, would see you upon us, because we walk with you every day. God, fill us with your joy now as we prepare to leave this place that we might share that joy and share what we have in you with others wherever we go. Tell them about the marvelous God that we love and that we serve and who loves us and has forgiven us of our sin and rebellion. God, we thank you. We praise you for your word today. May it sink deep into our hearts and change our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.